Ben Nighthorse Campbell is one of the most important Colorado politicians of the 20th century. He has been in the Rose Bowl parade in full Indian regalia, complete with one of the most magnificent eagle feather headdresses that still exists. He's a judo expert. So he moves to Japan and he doesn't know how to speak Japanese. And he gets the crap beat out of himself day after day after day. He has had so many different lives. He's a pilot and he's a horseman and he drove a truck and then he's a jeweler. I've never ever met anybody that has had so many full lives and reached the top at all of them. He just puts himself in the toughest situation and then makes himself have to figure it out. I had a coach and he used to have a saying, if you're gonna get involved in something, be a winner or a loser, but don't be a spectator. The minute he announced, I, I knew he'd win. If you're a spectator, it means the same as a quitter. You didn't do anything, you didn't try. He is a pretty interesting character. This program was made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future, honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional support from these organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. The orphanage had this little sailor suit. Every little boy got to take their picture with the sailor suit on. So it was one sailor suit and a bunch of little boys that all got their picture taken. But that's the only picture I've ever, ever seen when he was little. I didn't know my full name till I went in the military. But on my birth certificate, it's Benny Marshall Campbell. I grew up in a little town called Auburn in California, which is up in the gold country. Ben, when he was a child, his mother had tuberculosis. And oftentimes, when she would get really sick, she would have to put Ben and his sister in an orphanage. His dad was an alcoholic, and, and his mom could never hold him because she was afraid they would contact tuberculosis. This kind of formed, I think, an early part of his childhood where he was struggling with who he was, what his identity was. When he was in the orphanage, some of the nuns were pretty mean. Like if your fingernails were dirty, they threw him in with the pigs. Instead of you're gonna look like a pig, you're gonna be with the pigs. I mean, I can't even imagine just how terrorizing that has to be for a little kid. It gives you a lot more empathy for what somebody else goes through. I think I grew up with an empathy for people that have it tough, because I knew what it was like to have it tough. We were so poor when we were little kids. I remember one time my mother had a can of peas. That was supper. That's hard to even get through. She split the peas between my sister and me and she had the juice. He has a lot of scars, I think, that he overcomes by overachieving. Ben Nighthorse Campbell inherited nothing except his Indian identity and the strong songs and ceremonies and celebrations of the Cheyenne. Everything that he has earned He's earned it the hard way, and I respect that. You know, I was on the streets kind of in, in a, at loose ends, and I did have some brushes with the law. I was going the wrong way. No doubt in my mind, I was going the wrong way. 
This was during World War II, and some of us youngsters, when we wanted some gas, because uh, it was rationed, you couldn't get it without gas stamps, we would siphon it out of uh, tractors or parked cars or whatever, and uh, we got caught. And we got put in juvenile hall for a few days. I remember my dad coming to see me, and he said, how you like being locked up? And I said, I don't like it. And he said, I didn't either, because <laughs> he had been in and out of jail when he was young too. So I got out of that, and I never got in any more trouble. It became very clear to him when he was about 16 that he saw a very distinctive fork in the road where he knew if he didn't get himself you know, in a different situation, he was gonna end up in jail or in prison or dead. It really wasn't until he got into public school um, where he would be teased by other students in the school that he started to be bullied and recognized that he needed to do something about it. I had a job as a youngster in a fresh fruit shed in California. And at noontime, we'd, like all kids, we were wrestling around the lawn, and this little Japanese kid kept sitting on me, so to speak, throw me on the ground, sit on me. So Ben went and asked them to teach him judo and karate so he could defend himself. I was so angry about things that were kind of going wrong as a youngster in my life, I wanted to hit somebody. But the thing about judo, as any Japanese martial arts training, by the time you go through the training and you spend hours and hours and days and days and weeks and months and years doing it, by the time you develop the skills to use it, all that stuff's out of your system. If I hadn't found the military in judo, I really think to this day I probably would have ended up in jail. I think if I did anything with my life, it wasn't because I was aspiring to it, as much as it was a process of elimination of things I didn't want in my life. I didn't want alcoholism because my dad was alcoholic. I didn't want trouble because my dad was in trouble. I had always admired uh, law enforcement, even, even though I was on the wrong side a couple of times, but I admired them. So I went to military police school. I dropped out of high school to join the military when I was a senior. I went in the Air Force. I enrolled in the Air Police School in Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. And then I volunteered to go to Korea. They didn't send me by force. I volunteered to go and spent a year in the war in Korea. And uh, I can tell you when I watch the news now, when they talk about conflicts anywhere, if you haven't been in a war during the war, you have no idea how bad it is and tragic it is for the non-military people to get caught up in it. The civilians and the little kids. It's just heart-wrenching what those people have to go through We found out in 1960 and with the International Olympic Committee that judo would be included for the first time in history because it would also be the first time the Olympics were in Tokyo and I wanted to make that team. So I sold everything I had. I cashed in my life insurance policy. I sold my little hot rod I had in college and I went to Japan where I lived in for four years. He decides to become well-versed in judo and is willing to go to Japan for training. And you do not do that without deep, deep commitment. And that was something he did early as a young man. And those lessons, both of pain and endurance, stayed with him. And so I made that team. And I was captain of that team. But unfortunately, I went out with an injury just uh, during the medal rounds. When I came back from the Olympics, I was coaching a team in Sacramento, California, a judo team, and the school district I was teaching for asked me if I would teach a class to physical education teachers on beginning judo skills. And he came to my school the last period of the day, and I think that was probably the first time I ever saw him, and he was giving a class on teaching judo. And Linda was just out of college and got her first teaching job in California and she enrolled in uh, one of my classes and so that's how we met. She was very uh, disciplined, an athlete herself. She was a downhill racer when she was in college and she was pretty as a picture too. Still is too. I remember one time when I first met him and he said to me, which was kind of a surprise, he said, 
you scare me. And I said, how could I scare anybody? Why? And he said, because I have this wall built around me and I don't like to let anybody get inside of that wall. I think it was really difficult for him to get really close to anybody because said he was afraid he was going to lose it. And so when he said that, I thought, there's no way I'd ever leave him. I couldn't ever. It didn't matter, you know. My mom's a big reason that my dad is who he is. I really believe my mom has been the wind beneath the wings of my dad. My dad, he has a kind of an ongoing joke and he says, you know, if it wasn't for Linda, I'd be probably in some hotel room watching TV on an egg crate with a bunch of cool stuff outside that wasn't paid for. <laughs> as slight and as uh, feminine and as attractive as, as Linda Campbell is, She's made out of the same granite that Ben is. When I was in Sacramento after the Olympics, I got active in the Indian community there. I got interested in making jewelry again, which I had started when I was a boy. But in those days, we made all the jewelry out of melted coins. So we traded it for food or whatever we, whatever we could. So my dad is an artist. Most people don't know that about him. And it's been his passion, it's been his love, and it's been his outlet. I can show you his jewelry and explain to you like what phase of his life he was in. It's almost like a journal. And there's a lot of symbolism in his work. Nothing in his life is done haphazardly. Everything is with a clear intent. As a child, he didn't really know much about being Native American, and actually during that time period, it was not something you wanted to really admit to if you, if you could pass, for example, as a, as a non-Native. I think I began to search for my own roots like many Americans did, particularly Native Americans in the 1960s. I remember asking my dad, why did you leave the reservation? And I asked him that years ago when I was still young. He said, I got tired of being hungry. And so I asked him, who do I find? If I go home, who do I look for? He said, you find the Black Horse family. And so I did. So I found an Alec Black Horse whose father had been in the Custer battle. Ben's great grandfather was Black Horse. And when Ben was given his name by the Northern Cheyenne, he was given the name Night Horse. And that was to reflect on his great grandfather. Not long after he started doing his research about his tribal identity, the Northern Cheyenne actually made him an official enrolled member, and then he became one of the council chiefs. My wife's family goes clear back to covered wagon days here in Colorado. They had uh, come across the plains in the late 90s. That's 1890, not 1990. Uh, so she had pretty deep roots. I mean, real historic roots for Colorado. Maybe only second to my ancestors' roots, I suppose, in the state of Colorado, because the Cheyennes at one time were very predominant in the, in the state. looking for somebody to run for the state legislature, the District 59, and nobody wanted to run. At that time, they were just trying to get any Democrat to run against the beloved, you know, ex-president of the college. I mean, everybody loved the Republican. 
So they asked two or three people, and one said, I don't feel well, and the next one said, I'm too busy, and, and I was sitting on the end of the bench. And finally, they worked his way down to me, and they, they asked me, would you like to run? And I said, well, what do you do? And they said, well, uh, we'll show you. I said, does it take much time? They said, no, it doesn't take much time. I said, does it cost much money? No, it doesn't cost much money. Lie, lie, lie. The minute he announced, I, I knew he'd win. I mean, he always goes to the top. He would go town to town, and he would just get a map of the town, and he would park on one end, and he would just go door to door every single street until he had hit every door in that town. And then he would drive to the next town, and he would do the same thing. My dad, as a politician, he is the same as he is as an artist or as a person. I mean, he's just very direct and candid, and sometimes that is good, and sometimes that's not good, depending upon what he's telling you. He's, he's pretty much what you see is what you get. There's not a lot of um, sort of artificial pretense with my dad. Zero was the number of Native Americans when I got to Congress. And the last one before we, me was 1976. So I did um, three terms on the House side. I was going to give it maybe one more and go home. I didn't want to die there like so many of my friends ended up doing. Uh, and then what do you know? A Senate seat opened up. The politics of the past have sought to divide us. Ben Nighthorse Campbell has united us. Real life, real work, real leadership. Ben Nighthorse Campbell for Colorado's U.S. Senator. The time is now. So I thought, same thing, oh, what the hell, up or out, I'll give it a try. He rose from the ranks as a state legislator to Congress and then to the U.S. Senate. He is the only Colorado politician I'm aware of who never lost an election and changed parties, went from being a Democrat to being a Republican. Little by little, I felt really estranged from the Democratic Party. He learned once he got to Congress that um, it was really the Republicans who did a lot for Native Americans in the country and not the Democrats so much. I realized I kept voting with those darn Republicans as a Democrat. So I changed parties. As you know, uh, this morning I am announcing my uh, change of affiliation to the Republican Party. Yeah. That was a huge controversy here, especially in the Durango area. When Ben flipped parties, it was very difficult. He had um, garnered quite a bit of uh, dollars, a war chest as a Democrat. And when he took that over to the Republican side, uh, there were hard feelings. I don't think it was an easy decision for him to make. It just made more sense for him to, to switch parties. I was the second person in Colorado history that won as a member of either party. I won as a Democrat and I won as a Republican in my next election. He was always in the center, and it didn't matter whether he was a Democrat or a Republican. I think one of the things about Ben, he's really neither party. Public lands, uh, water projects, uh, Native Americans, uh, law enforcement, education. It was about five or six areas that I really tried to focus on. And so things like um, the bill I sponsored was to provide money for bulletproof vests for policemen. And we could track after a few years policemen who were still alive because they got hit in the chest and they had one of those deaths that we got the money for. I, would, I was proud of that uh, record. And some people, you know, they say, they weren't major bills. Well, tell that to some cop's mother whose life was saved because of that bulletproof vest. That was a damn important bill.
Somewhere along the line, I said, I'm not going to die in this place. You know, I want to do what I can, but I'm not dying here. I want to go home and be with my family. When a senator or a congressman, whenever they leave office, they have to take everything out of their office, right? So um, we arranged to have these huge, I mean, it's two moving vans, literally pack everything up and move it here. A lot of the things that are on display up at Fort Lewis College now are commonly called my collection. As you go along in the Indian community, sooner or later you need some beaded moccasins and then you know, a shirt and you sort of accumulate things. Uh, the headdress though, sometimes in uh, white language is called war bonnet, but native people call it headdress. When you do a good deed or you accomplish a feat, something you're kind of proud of and your people are proud of it, you're given a feather. He fought hard for water rights for the Southern Ute uh, with the uh, Animus La Plata project, which was very controversial. There were a lot of people that didn't want that to go through. When you have ranchers and farmers who are not native, who want access to that water as well. The water project here that I finally got passed after 15 years of work was a concept that sounds nutty. You want to pump water uphill? to put it in a water impoundment, that uh, flies in the face of gravity and common sense. Well, I don't know, it may be. But on the other hand, go to a store, any store, and find out what you pay for a gallon of gas and what you pay for four quarts of water. You're paying more now for water than for gasoline. So there's no doubt in my mind, in the dry Southwest, we have got to find a way to share the water. The primary reason for that water is to give the priority rights to the Ute Indian tribes. But the secondary effect, you'll see bait shops springing up and all kinds of little things as it does around any lake in Durango. So there's, a, there's an economic impact, particularly for tourism, with having a beautiful lake in your town. Well, it's called Lake Night Horse, and my father was not seeking that or asking for that, but I think that was, um, it's a very flattering thing. He also helped build hospitals. He helped build facilities on reservations. He's very important, I think, will go down as having helped us get the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site as a unit of the National Park System. The National Museum of the American Indian, if I was ever wanted to be remembered for one single thing above all other, it would be that museum. Uh, because I'm a firm believer that you can't have a good future unless you learn from the past. I would describe Ben as a renaissance man. I think that's the best way to describe him because he's done so many things in his life. He's, he's been successful at everything he's tried. And I think that's because of his judo training. It's that discipline. It's figuring out how to do it and never giving up. I've always felt a sort of pressure to accomplish as much as I can in my life because of what my dad's been able to accomplish. I don't know that I would say that that makes it hard to be me, but it certainly is always a reminder that I've got to try to do the best I can with all the things that I get involved with. It's a lot to live up to, for sure. The saddest part of my whole professional career was what I didn't do. When I should have been home helping my kids with their homework, I was out fighting a battle over some bill in Washington, D.C. That kind of stuff, will I'll never have a second chance, and, I, and I'm sorry. I think my kids have forgiven me, they know, because they worked hard in my campaign. Both of my children did. But it's something that I really regret not being able to give at least equal time to. Ben's legacy will be as one of the few really high-ranking Native American politicians in American history. Not only just in Congress uh, and his jewelry, I mean, to be recognized for, for his caring, I think especially for Colorado. Even though he's born and raised in California, his heart is here in Colorado. The legacy, I think it's what crowd you're in. When you're in the judo crowd, it's judo. When you're in the horse crowd, it's the horses. When you're in the political, it's all of the things that he got done in the political arena.
who knows what he's going to do next? I mean, that's what's crazy about him. In a 10-year period, he goes from, you know, being almost homeless to this Olympian. And I think in the next 10 years, who knows what he's going to do? He, he could surprise us all, but then none of us would be surprised. He is revered, will be revered for a variety of contributions. His biographer will have plenty to do.